Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Forty Oti podcast with me, Thomas Henley from the Asperger's Growth Channel, and of course, more importantly, the Forty Oti podcast. How are you guys doing? It's great to have you back on the podcast, ready for another little chat. I hope you've uh, got your pajamas on and you're, you're cozying up on the sofa, or I don't know, maybe maybe you're at work or something, like that, or doing some cleaning. Probably not if you're autistic, but Thomas is rambling. Anyway, today we're talking about autism and relationships, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason the reason why we're、uh, laughing about it is because we've already done a take of this, and、um, <laughs> uh, for some reason, some reason, the podcasting website that I'm using has been a bit rubbish. So,、uh, but anyway, I am joined today by BB, aka Aspergirl. Uh, how are you, BB? I'm doing. I'm doing really well.、Um, round two. It's going to be the best time.、Um, I love that you blamed it on the website and not on the fact that I live in the Arctic, and it was probably my shitty internet connection that made the whole thing、uh, just disintegrate. <laughs> <laughs> it is、um, minus thirty Celsius, and when I went down to just get some water in between takes, there's like a major blizzard outside. I was just like, and I'm gonna go back upstairs. <laughs>、um, yeah, I haven't left the house today. I'm still in my pajamas, and、um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you again. <laughs> Again, hooray! <laughs> it's a new. It's the first time we're talking. <laughs> That's right. It's all new. This has never happened before. Everybody, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So,、um, do you want to kind of give everybody an introduction into who you are and the kind of things that you do? Yeah, absolutely.、Um, my name is Bibi. I am a comedian slash、uh, writer slash. Just whatever <laughs>、um, I need to be <laughs> kind of person.、Um, yeah, I live in Iqaluit, Nunavut, which is the capital of the territory of Nunavut, and it's in Canada. And I'm 63 degrees north. It's a fly-in only community on Baffin Island, which is near Greenland.、Um, so it's a very remote place, and I, I, I'm absolutely loving it. And I lived here for seven years. Um, how I got into comedy is, is just because、um, there was really a need for it in our community, and、uh, the rest of Canada was asking what's going on in Nunavut. So we started just doing our own thing.、Um, I also I love writing, so、mm. right now I'm doing strategic planning and、um, communications for our college in town, which is really fun. And I also volunteer and run the Youth Pride or LGBTQ. Uh, society、um, at the high school and work with a lot of the queer youth who keep me young and fresh. And yeah, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over the place. And yeah, I started Asper Girl, my Instagram account about、um, opening up my life about being autistic. And yeah, I started that three months ago, and it's going pretty great. So I'm just sort of going with my autistic flow on that. And、uh, yeah, in a couple of weeks, I will be traveling a lot and sort of getting entering the busy time of my of my year. So yeah, I'm just excited to have this week to yeah get out of my pajama hole and talk to you and kind of get back on track. So cool. So why why did you choose to start up your your social media? Um, page, I think it's page, isn't it? Yeah.、Um, and what what sort of drove you to do it, and what do you hope to do with it? Um, it was really 
not a conscious decision almost um being in in comedy and one of the reasons why i actually like i I, as a writer i have been hesitant in the past about performing and and actually doing my own stand-up is because of social media and you know the pressure to just even when you're not on stage, you still have to be on and promoting yourself and interacting with people and being this sort of persona. And, you know, for many autistics, we spend our lives just trying to be ourselves that um, the thought of having to, you know, share publicly who you are, even on that journey of trying to figure it out was really nerve wracking. So I actually debated just shutting off all of my social media accounts Um pretty recently and it was in that moment where I just thought you know what like I'm having this negative reaction to uh, social media and mainly because as an autistic person and having a lot of success in my life that I feel people think that my life is very easy or that um, it's perfect so that really bothered me that I didn't have a way to articulate how much I've struggled uh, and how much every moment is is crazy and weird and and challenging and you know my interior monologue is not anything but but perfect so it was in that moment that I felt you know what like let's give this a try let me be brutally open and and um, that's sort of what inspired me to do it was that it was just really really scary and it was you know something that. I hadn't considered and then just mm. had to do it. And uh, I have no doubt in saying that you you have been sort of a social media hit, if I can say that. Um, you definitely you definitely have like gained quite a, a lot of following in, in three months. Um, I, I have like no, nowhere near like the kind of following that you have <laughs> um, on, on Instagram. Um, of course, so I've got no idea how you do it, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think we do put a lot of, I think we put a lot of emphasis on, especially like in the arts community, you're putting yourself out there. I don't know where this whole idea of whoever developed social media is a genius to have this whole idea of like followers and um, and in number forms, everybody can see it's basically like, let's just take Mm -hmm. our worst high school experience and like put it out there as a way to like track success. So I know a lot of people, because again, I work with with comedians and other artists who are quite successful and have a big following. And I, I, you know, even with that comes just as much anxiety and pressure and in no way indicates like social or emotional success. So one thing actually that has happened like when I first started the account I had a very different approach I kind of almost posted it in this way that like nobody's following me so nobody's gonna see this and it was almost just Mm -hmm. cathartic and then as I started you know realizing like this I'm not the first person to do this like there's a lot of autistics out there who are who are memeing and who have all these different styles and and who are really like communicating these are real people I always felt like social media was just like ads and and jargon and this yeah like perfect poison that we're all like trying to swallow so um yeah it it was crazy to see like how the uh the autistic community like these are real people and and the stories that they're sharing are actually really really special and raw because people are just sharing so that's what sort of inspired me like oh I want to do memes or this is funny or I have thoughts on this and then once I started communicating (laughs) with people and and it built from and then people were asking me questions so I would turn them into posts and and stuff like that um yeah, so that's kind of where like Asper Girl uh, came from. But in when I d- did start it, it was more just like I don't think anybody's gonna look at this, and uh, and I and I didn't really think much of it other than I do work with a lot of youth in town, and um, Nunavut's a really interesting territory in that we're the only Indigenous um, run a territory in Canada and 90% of 
the population is Inuit. I'm not in Enoch. I'm a basic white girl that just moved up here. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do relate as an autistic person. I do really, really relate to um, the struggles of really, you know, wanting to be recognized and wanting to be heard and working with a lot of queer youth and mm-hmm. being a mentor and being an advocate for their not only their sexual health, but their mental health and um, them just fighting to reclaim their stories and their history and their language. It really resonated with me. And we have the highest suicide rates in the world um, in Nunavut. And I I know a lot. Actually, a, a friend of mine passed away recently. And I just, oh, again, I'm this so was triggered by the fact why I just knew that if I was going to be able to continue to be the strong person, I was going to, who people look to for support, that I was going to need to sort of dig down deeper and find my own ways of, of coping. Because autistics also have a high suicide rate like we it's important that we find Mm -hmm. our voices that we find each other because you know i think every autistic person could say that they have thoughts where they just not even suicide but just feel like i wish i didn't exist existing is just so hard you know so it's important that we don't get lost (laughs) existence is pain it's important that we (laughs) we we don't get lost in that and that's why my approach is always Mm -hmm. really really positive because um it's important that you get out of your head and out of those those cycles and again i've i have achieved a lot of success in my life and i do attribute it to the fact that i'm autistic so i i want to be open about that and and um yeah i think that a lot of as you just you you know you open the floodgates you just never know what's gonna happen and Mm -hmm. i'm seeing that instead of me being like the one person out there it's like oh as soon as you say something other people will will join you or at least um maybe listen or i -hmm. do have a lot of followers who are neurotypical and uh also resonate so i think again we're all trying to like swallow this pill of perfection and it's the people that are that are being real who are all of a sudden um yeah the ones who other people are like you know what (laughs) that sounds better than what the media or what our governments or what our doctors and professionals are saying so yeah it's good that's awesome and I, i i very much um respect and like that you uh, sort of pitch your your posts and your ideas towards neurotypical people as well. So I feel like although um, sort of like uh, posts and, and things for autistic people are great and they, you know, give, give people, autistic people, a lot of ways of coping and ways of viewing things and coming, getting over struggles and realizing their own sort of potential. There is there is always a very heavy influence from the outside world on autistic people. And I think, I think everywhere in the world, to be honest, even the UK was such a good sort of special needs system in in place. There is a very large disconnect in what people view as autism. They don't really understand it. Mm -hmm. They can sort of pick up on the, the negatives, but they don't, really get to the core of it and I, I really like that you you know you you pitch your stuff towards neurotypical people to help them understand as well I think that's really great and also your <laughs> also I, I very much like your Instagram name you sound like um Elastigirl of <laughs> the Incredibles yes that's I'm Elaspagirl yes I'm going for the bionic superpower approach um, i was surprised that like asked again i was just kind of doing it to be funny and then i'm like really asper girl is not taken well i think this is my calling um but i will tell you a little secret and i i actually do not believe that there's really a difference between neurotypical and neurodivergent i think it is a big spectrum there's one standard that in especially in you know post-colonial Western society that we're sort of pitched and then it kind of goes like who fits that mold and then everybody who who doesn't outside 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 of that um, you know labels are good sometimes but also 
you know, not great over time. And I've lived in many different cultures I, I, before I lived here. I've lived in Nunavut for seven years. Before that, I lived in, in Ghana for four years. And uh, growing up in downtown Toronto, there's people from all over the world. And, you know, I think it's really important to acknowledge that our thinking and how our thinking is labeled is largely reflected on, you know, the the perspectives of the people in power and that if you don't fit in and if you're really struggling in one situation, often if you go and find the other people who are oppressed or off, who are also experiencing difference and othering, and if you learn from them and share their stories and you will realize there's so many different ways of thinking and there's so many different approaches to life and there are spaces where you will feel perfectly normal and perfectly capable. So my approach really is like, I don't think people should have to like leave their their jobs or leave their families to go and on this pilgrimage to find a place that they are welcome. But how can we make those little changes in our lives to make our our space and our mind and our environments a sanctuary, a sanctuary that respects us? And that's pretty much what I've done with my life. And as somebody who looks very, very straight and who looks very, very neurotypical, you know, I don't like when people judge me. <laughs> and I remember what it used to be. If you had told, I remember somebody asked me when I was in grade seven, when I said, I really don't like boys, they're gross. And somebody asked me, well, do you like girls? Do you think you're gay? And I wish I could go to that moment and be like, Maybe I am. And that would have like totally changed the direction of my life <laughs> because, you know, from the next 10 years, it came out when I was 21. I was just another straight neurotypical person, too. So you never know who this neurotypical person that you might be doubting or assuming that they're not going to respect you is and what they're going through. Because maybe you speaking out about your experiences or you acknowledging them with respect might make them go, oh my gosh, may I might be autistic too. And that is just like the key now to my life. And then you'll forever be that person who, <laughs> you know. <laughs> covering them. Yeah. So I think it's a two-way. It, it, it's a two-way street because I, I I still remember uh, that my first girlfriend who, you know, we were working at Starbucks together and we ended up like making out in the back room and she was like, you're totally gay. I'm like, no, I'm not. And then like that just changed the rest of my life. So I'm so glad that she took a chance on me, this really awkward, asexual, straight girl and was like, no, this girl's a badass dyke. I know it. And I'm going to bring that out of her. And she did. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we got to save the neurotypicals, <laughs> free them. Save <laughs> that's, them. That's, that's save ask them for girls mission. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to find you. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, I never, I never make assumptions. Everybody's on the spectrum somewhere, whether again, it's gender, Gender, sexuality, you know, I, I think one thing that's beautiful mm -hmm. about the autistic mind is it's very fluid. We we have been conditioned to try and make these like label ableist connections, but really we don't think that way. And that's what makes us different. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to try and promote that or try and say acknowledge our difference, we also have to be respectful to other people as well. Yeah. I think um, I, I I get where you're coming from with the whole, um, you know, like with the labels and all of that kind of stuff. Like, I think one way which we may be slightly different is that, so I, I went to, I went to uni and I studied a lot of um, stuff to do with like neuroscience and, and psych and a little bit of psychology and stuff. And um, my, my, you know, sort of my dissertation and, and all of that kind of stuff was centered around um, differences in autistic and neurotypical brains, um, according to when they're diagnosed and, and all that. And um, I think, I think one, one of one of the difficulties with anything that is diagnosed based on things like, you know, what they would, they would call traits, or ways of behaving behaving can be a very sort of difficult thing to navigate from 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 the research that I've looked at and the 
the things that I've dived into, there, there does there does appear to be a lot of sort of genetic and brain structural differences between um, autistic and neurotypical people, the ones that are, you know, the ones that are diagnosed autistic. And I, f- I do think I understand about the whole, you know, spectrum thing, but I feel like, I feel like people are either, they have um, autistic genetics, but anybody from the neurotypical spectrum to the autism spectrum can have any number of traits that people would classify as being autistic traits. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh, for sure. I'm also, I do study um, neuropsychology on the side. And one of the reasons why I was diagnosed, how I was diagnosed Mm -hmm. is that I was originally diagnosed as borderline personality disorder, as many of us young women are and um when i and i wanted to get that expunged from my record because i just didn't believe it was true and so i I participated because i was at university of toronto and i participated in a borderline personality disorder study in which they had to um interview us but also there was a lot of things that were going to measure our brain functions and how and observe us doing tasks and stuff and it was during then that they said i don't think did you have you ever been tested for autism and i was like i knew i wasn't bpd but then i was like wait what but i'm not a young man who likes math like i can't be (laughs) autistic and then uh so then all of a sudden i'm like wait a minute so now i'm not borderline but i'm this I'm out of here. Did they like, did they so like to the throw Arctic. a deck of <laughs> did they like throw a deck of cards on the floor and ask you how many like <laughs> or matchsticks on the floor? Uh, no, but I had to do I had to do a lot of like building towers and uh, like okay. little IQ tests and um, other fine motor skills. I, I can't remember all the specific ones that I had to do because it was over three days of testing and I remember I had just come back from seeing my girlfriend who uh well ex-girlfriend but she's still my best friend who is actually on the spectrum as well so it was funny that uh, and I was so tired so I don't really remember all the things that that happened Mm -hmm. to me because I was so jet lagged um and also she's a musician so I had been like you know, doing touring and doing like music stuff, and then had to do this like three days of very intense like psycholo- psychology of evaluation. But it's funny that oh. she's actually on the spectrum as well. And at the time, again, going back to my neurotypical labels, I was like, I can't, I'm, you know, I'm just crazy. Like, <laughs> I'm not autistic, I'm just weird and crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not the same. But we are. So I'm from um, a different planet. That's it. I'm a different species. <laughs> I know. I, I think a lot of us have those those things. So I think my I guess what I meant was as autistics, our approach to life is fundamentally different because of the way that our brain is structured. But how we process and how we identify ourselves that has been conditioned largely by the context in which we've we've grown up in yeah for example my favorite comedy reference to ever make is that here i am like always wondering and and worrying about my social approach and how i'm gonna fit into a situation meanwhile like bob the like you know fat lazy you know neurotypical like dude that likes hockey just like smashes around a party offending everyone doesn't care usually i'm end up in a corner talking to that guy and he doesn't care that i'm not enjoying myself or that you know so it's it's i just mean that in terms of like how we edit ourselves really it depends on the context that we're in Mm -hmm. you know and so as a gay person on the spectrum you know i'm technically expected to edit myself more because the mainstream is a neurotypical heteronormative culture so i'm aware that if i were to just go out you know loud and proud you know just hyper focusing at a bus stop on something stimming away i'll get looks right meanwhile a neurotypical a, a abrasive man could walk around belly hanging out drinking a beer nobody would care right even though 
so that's what I meant in terms of like the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not so much that our brains are the same. It's how we're choosing to present ourselves in public and what we're or, and our awareness of what is right and what's wrong. Yeah, I get that. Cool. So you you did mention that you um you've you've had a rela- relationship with an autistic person. Like what was your experience with neurotypical and autistic relation? What did you say before? It was like ND and ND. NT and NDs. <laughs> NT and Yeah. And ND yeah. and Ds. Uh, yes. Yeah. Now we're getting into like the meat of the discussion, the love. <laughs> it's like we uh, say we were going to just like not why I was much, invited. But... <laughs> <laughs> why wasn't the real the real stuff? Now that you you know how I think, let's get into how I feel. Uh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> I have had relationships. Uh, being an artist and in the arts community. Um, you know, there's a lot of different brains out there that I'm exposed to. So I've had both like ND and D relationships, and now I'm in a really amazing NT and D partnership. Um, and so there's, there's pros and cons to both, but I think, um, the relationship structure in general, and it is, you know, is always challenging because everybody has an idea of what they think or want hmm. their perfect relationship Just in general. to be in general. And mm-hmm. everybody combats loneliness. Like I'm an only child that that grew up in a big city who, to be honest, like I never really cared too much about friendships or put that much effort in. I went to a small school and I was always, I always had friends. I was always pretty well liked. People really liked my ideas. I was an activist kid. I relate a lot to Greta Thunberg in terms of I skipped school a lot with my friends to, you know, protest for equal pay for women. And, uh, you know, I went to a feminist school. So the teachers were like super supportive of that. And I was always treated like, you know, uh, it's almost like, the go-to girl of the school and uh one day I came back from my Christmas vacation in grade 10 I'll never forget this and all of my friends literally felt like overnight were all of a sudden interested in boys and makeup and watching days of our lives and didn't want to protest or be rowdy crazy fun free young girls anymore and that's when my struggle finding connection and finding relationships really 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 I guess Mm -hmm. heightened because I always had the awareness that that I was different but I was in such an environment that it never really bothered me or I always found a way to use my difference and my my brain power to unite people uh, around me and then when I couldn't do that anymore uh it I just felt so lonely like I was looking at the world from a fish tank and you know Mm. everyone's around me and I can see all these people in front of me but I can't I can't connect with them and then it was even worse when you know I was trying to to date men and that's when I would have these great connections but then there was no physical connection um, because I was terrified and I didn't want to be touched so I just thought like okay I guess I'm asexual um so being able to come out first as gay and then, you know, five years later as a gay autistic woman, um, that's really changed my approach to relationships. And I would say it's only since becoming or discovering my autistic mind that I've actually been able to like delve in and have really full and meaningful relationships. I kind of was just always skimming the surface before or um yeah, wasn't able to like, I was either coming off as like way too distant or mm-hmm. I never knew that if people liked me and I didn't even know the first me step either. to dating or it was the opposite where I <laughs> thought someone liked me. So I was like bringing them flowers yeah. and being mm-hmm. so romantic. And then they were just like, stop following me. <laughs> like, why? Are you one of those people why who Googles, you- <laughs> Googled about it? Like, like oh Googles. yeah, I googled like yeah. Does he how like to me? Does she like me? Out, how to tell if somebody likes me? Psychological signs of affection and all that kind of stuff. 
Oh, absolutely. Like that was me a hundred percent. And again, it's funny that I look at there. Yeah. If I would say to call up some of my past relationships, there are relationships where girls I'm sure were like, oh my gosh, BB was like such a bitch. And she was like so cold and not interested. And there is uh, the flip side of girls who I'm sure have blocked me on social media. because they're like, this girl's crazy. So it's funny how it's like, how could I be both people, you know, <laughs> like, um, well, I suppose, I suppose it's kind of like, it's, it's difficult, especially, I mean, I usually refer to it as the, um, the terror of teenagehood because I, I've, I've never met anybody who is on the autistic spectrum who has enjoyed their teenagehood. I know it's not particularly great for everybody because of the hormones and stuff, but there's a lot of difficulties with teenagehood with all the hormones and the people change when they, when they start getting those yeah. puberty hormones running through them. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I really, I like the idea of the, the fishbowl looking out. Because there's there's always sort of like this wall up between, well, there there was a wall up between me and other people where I I couldn't believe that anybody could really get what I'm saying and get why I feel something. And it was, yeah, it was really difficult. And I think that was a big barrier in terms of relationships as well. But I was, I was... I'd be very cold and I'd be out that sort of, as you said, looking for a fishbowl. And, um, but then if, you know, there's been some times in my life when I've, I've found someone that I really like and, and sometimes I get too emotionally involved because I'm like, Oh, Oh no. Like they actually want to listen to me and they, they want to understand me. That's, that's mad. And, um, I get very overexcited and then suddenly my emotions are all, all invested into it. So I, I get that sort of flip flopping those, those two different sides. Cause I feel like I'm sort of similar in that way. It's um, yeah, I get that. And the incessant, you know, chasing of people who most people would, you know, see as not being interested in you when sort of not really picking up that someone's, interested in you as well <laughs> like uh it's mm-hmm. um i think we we don't bring that like that that and that comes to do with again with our with our social approach i think you know again neurotypicals usually enter a situation kind of with an idea in mind and then just kind of go from there and they have um more like set up boundaries or expectations whereas we're we're such feelers we're more instinctual um but our instincts are different than what neurotypicals are. So we're so focused on these little details that the other people don't see and that what is obvious to other people isn't obvious to us. So we need things kind of spoken or directly stated to yeah. us. And that's definitely not the approach in, in at least Western world. I really loved living in Ghana, where which is in West Africa, and the culture is so direct. Like most of my friends in town – um, where I live, there's a lot of West Africans and I like love living near them and hanging out with them so much because it's so direct. It's just, hey, I like you. Will you date me? Sure. Oh, I'd love Let's that. Do it. Be like, awesome. it's, oh, everything is direct. If there's an argument, it's like a yelling match. And then as soon as it is resolved, everybody like is happy, like goes their separate ways. Um, a contract will be better next time. Than set up like a, <laughs> could you send just send at the bottom if you uh, agree to this and uh you mm-hmm. can get started on the uh, relationship <laughs> absolutely yeah, yeah so <laughs> i would so and i think that's another thing that's really challenging with with autistics and non-autistic relationships is that autistics we like to have as much information up front as possible we want mm-hmm to like we like to it's almost like once we know where the boundaries is are then we can almost like orient ourselves and relax with that. whereas with a that. lot of neurotypical people yeah and we can relax whereas i i had this experience recently where you know the, the person or uh, she didn't really know what she wanted and she was out of a big relationship and you know she wanted to just sort of go with the flow and that was really overwhelming and stressful for me because mm-hmm. i felt like our quote unquote 
non-relationship was really, really intense. And it was hard for me to commit and, and match all, and just like, you know, throw myself into her arms, even though we were having a really good time. It was hard for me to uh, go with it when I really didn't understand where things were going. And that when we decided to like, okay, let's cool it off and just sort of be friends. I didn't really know what that meant, like how to just, okay, like, you know, I think those little separations are hard. And, 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 and sometimes I think for autistics, we expect expectations then to be clearly communicated to us. And sometimes those subtleties, like you can't, right. And I think it's important to have, um, yeah, mm-hmm. just uh, both people need to compromise to each other. And I think the problem for autistics, and this is what gets really challenging um, for us to think about, again, having to sort of the idea that we also have to listen to neurotypicals because we're so used to doing that all of the time. <laughs> but <laughs> that, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. it's in, Yeah, it's important that... Um, we get in this habit of letting them know or letting our neurotypical partner know of the times that we're uncomfortable or unclear rather than just like going with it. Mm -hmm. Because then when the times where we shut down or we hit our breaking point and we feel like uh, we need to be accommodated without question, often the neurotypical person, all they see is us melting down. They don't understand why and, and, what and you've done what's happening and the kind yeah, of compromises and all they see is this meltdown and then when we come to and say hey like i had this one meltdown but all of these other times i've been like sort of bending or masking or going along with this yeah and it's really important that it doesn't get to the point where then you have to like prove all the times that you were doing xyz and that you know, that they now should just accommodate you because you've been accommodating them, that comes off to a neurotypical person as you being manipulative or you being stubborn. And it's hard for you to articulate, no, if you just knew how much I was doing for you or how you never call me stubborn, you'd never call me unfeeling, you'd never call me rigid. So I always tell that to parents as well. It's like you really need to start giving your children and helping them find the vocabulary. Or um, I have a a friend whose daughter like communicates in sign language. And um, then I have other friends who whose kids, you know, use TikTok or other find help them find a medium that they can start articulating their real feelings and needs and times that they feel in distress rather than encouraging them to sort of mask or repress it because the best what my current partner who's neurotypical we have a great relationship because we're constantly checking in with each other and I I now know that I can stay stuff like this isn't going to be a good situation for me or yeah. I'm feeling this way or when she says I you're be BB, you're talking way too loud. Keep your voice down. I don't have to take it personally anymore. Like we just are coming from, we're coming at each other with not making any assumptions. And we're also re- responsive to each other's needs rather than like, you know, freaking out when, when there's a big episode. Cause I've been in relationships where, you know, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to do whatever they say and everything's going to be okay and it's going to be the best relationship ever. There'll be no conflict. So we'd go for months where there's no conflict. I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do, um, orienting myself in between what that person's needs are. And then I hit my breaking point. Then I have a huge meltdown. And Mm -hmm. then what? Then you can never sort of recover from that. And then the next relationship I get into and I just go, okay, this time I'm just not going to melt down. No matter what, I won't melt down. And this was obviously before um, I actually knew that I was autistic. And now I know that there's no way that I can say I'm not going to melt down, shut down, whatever. the, The whole point, though, is how can you... Are, you know, advocate for yourself and start creating conditions and finding people um, who will support you and what you need so that, you know, meltdowns are unavoidable, but 
you know, they're at least going to be small and they're going to be something you can laugh about afterwards and something you go, okay, you know, I learned from this and it wasn't a big deal. And the partner is like, yeah, that's, you know, you had every right to re- react that way. And yeah. Cool. So you've, you've given quite a, like, like a lot of um, sort of your sort of experiences with dating, dating neurotypicals and uh, also, also a little bit of advice for uh, <laughs> an autistic person dating a neurotypical. And um, there, were, there was this, this like something that I picked, I picked up on. And I think, you know, when, when you sort of come into like the early stages of re- relationships, there seems to be a lot more re- relaxation on the, the um, sort of the ne- neurotypical side of the relationship like they like to they enjoy sort of feeling things out and test it, testing boundaries and and sort of trying to figure out what the expectations are rather than just stating them up front and I think a lot of the time when when autistic people get into relationships they will try not try not to be like that because sometimes it comes comes across to people who don't understand autism as being quite intense maybe for some people which is not but it's there's a lot more of like tension and stress and anxiety um surrounded by the constant trying to test boundaries because obviously like we struggle a little bit trying to pick up on that Mm -hmm. stuff and and um in terms of like give like ad- advice for autistic people dating neurotypicals it's um yeah i do i do agree with you know the whole be being communicative and stuff and uh i do you know now, now that you've sort of brought it to brought it to light and you've, you've chatted about it a little bit communicating what you need on a regular basis is is more ideal than letting all of it brew up and then and loading it on people because as as much as your partner may want to understand you and try to accommodate you, they're not particularly aware of all the ways that you're sort of applying yourself to the so called normal framework of relationships and ways of communicating and stuff like that. And and being able to even although it may be sort of a, a ball ache at first, <laughs> like um regularly sort of communicating that stuff is quite important no matter if you know if you say i think i think one of one of the examples is you know i need some need some time away i need some alone time just to recharge my social battery that can be quite hard for people who don't understand what a social battery is like people usually like neurotypical Mm -hmm. people have like power banks and charging outlets on every single street corner it's what whereas for us we have to like retreat to either a, a bedroom or a toilet and just plug it into one of the only outlets that we have <laughs> that's a very weird mm-hmm. analogy but definitely um yeah no i i agree um but i think that again that goes back to the whole like idea of what you you need in a relationship and what you sort of want or expect from just a beautiful you know hollywood movie relationship like oh take me in your arms all of us kiss me passionately yeah Yeah. Yeah, and then or once you get once you get through the like you know courting and like honeymoon stage oh everything's gonna be amazing and that's actually when like the real work begins but i feel like nobody in western society is really given the tools you know for how to do it that's why a lot of the time everyone's going on instagram for like advice from these like influencers um because there's like everybody's just sort of desperate for tips on how to orient themselves because nobody learned how but i think like one thing you know in terms of communication like everybody communicates really really differently so the you know neurotypicals have a more um basic or basic for us view of like communication in terms of like most of it is verbal or um you know and you tell somebody or you write it down but a lot of us communicate in in really different ways and that we feel like we're sort of showing or articulating ourselves Uh, yeah 
or I know like when you know I see if because I've dated neuro um neuro, neurodivergence and these before like I know when my partner is mm-hmm. like stimming or uh, you know I can recognize some of her behaviors that she doesn't even need to say anything to me I know she might be in distress or she's happy or you know we got to get out of here and we can leave a situation yeah. or you know she doesn't have to give me any I can just look at her and know and um, one of my best friends who we used to date and we still check in with each other and stuff all of the time. And it still is when we are in a room together, people will think that we are twins and we can, I kid you not, communicate with each other without saying anything. Mm-hmm. Um, my current partner loves watching us together. She's like, you guys are like little fairies off in your own off in your own dreamland which again one thing which was it was great for the communication factor to be in a relationship with an autistic woman but on the flip side we did you know there are struggles too where you know when you're in, in a neurotypical relationship it almost forces you sometimes to become better in different aspects of communication likewise with when a, an autistic person's able to uh, educate a neurotypical person that there's different ways of communicating and there's different signs and things to look out for rather than just words. Um, and you can get away from the, but you never told me, right? You can you see like, but I'm showing you all of the time and you need to be more observant. But one thing that was really hard that can be hard with dating an autistic person is that you can almost get like too lost in yourselves and, you know, forget that there is a whole reality out there that you need to um, partake in and that, you know, somebody needs to clean the house and somebody (laughs) needs to be Uh, organized. And, and if you both kind of lack the time, (laughs) yes, the executive functioning, it can be a battle. Um, And one thing that, you know, I I appreciate so much about my partner, she's a very organized and very, very clean Mm -hmm. and, um, we have almost like a system where she's like, I will clean and cook and keep the house nice. If you like entertain me and, uh, you know, come up with, I'm re- I love planning trips and going on vacations and, and stuff. And I'm really, really good at coming up with like creative things to do. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm a very social person and I'm a very wild person, but not very conventional. And I love that. Like it it's like we doses. have a system where I will, yeah, or I'll make the house a home in terms of providing the creative touches and um, making the space really engaging and special. And she will clean it and make sure that my needs are met so that I can continue creating. Because ultimately, like if the house gets to a point where it's gross and smelly and uh, uninhabitable, I can't autistic people we cannot function as well and I think a lot of people forget about that they think like they don't understand why they're in bad moods or they're shutting down or they're um distraught or unable to regulate their emotions and a lot of that it's to do with like if you're not drinking enough water if you're not eating properly Mm -hmm. if your space especially your creative space is cluttered and you can't get on top of that um And I mean, I know once I get to a point, I call it the point of no return. Mm -hmm. Once my like office space gets too disorganized, I don't even know where to start organizing it. And then I'll just be like, I'm just going to shut the door and like work on the couch until that (laughs) becomes uninhabitable. So just forget it for as (laughs) much as I think it it is. Yeah, just I'll just buy a new. I'll just move. uh, You know, (laughs) I'll just move to a new city. That's when I know it's time for me to move to a new country. When I've like exhausted all of my spaces um, with cookie crumbs and writing materials I no longer need. But anyway, just kidding. Um, Yeah, I think that's one of the pros to dating uh, somebody who's different brained than you, especially again, my current partner, different brained. She, we are completely complimentary. We even did like our Myers-Briggs ah. and, and we've done some other personality tests and we are always do you do the 16 like personality on one? the other end. Uh, yes. Um, I am the INFP. It's always IN with, with autistic people yeah. in my experience. <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I used, 
I used to be very extroverted. And I think it's important for people to check in with themselves and their personalities over time. Yeah. Because as a kid, I was quite extroverted. And now I'm an introvert. And that, and I was really shocked to like find that out about myself. But I think in the last 10 years, I'd say actually, especially since becoming, being diagnosed, I, a lot of my extroversion came from feeling like I had to be social and especially Mm -hmm. I was an actor as a kid and then trying to break into like the writing and um, comedy industries, you know, a lot of the time that, oh, I hate this word, networking happens at the parties or after the shows or, you know, being seen. So it wasn't an option. Like when I look back at my childhood and my early adulthood I mean no wonder I was such a mess because I was basically like forcing social and super heavy duty unnatural partying on myself for the sake of I want this so bad and so I will literally do anything so I came up with a lot of tricks to help me cope like you know I used to I didn't drink and didn't smoke I'd always um drink uh like soda water and pretend that i was having like a vodka soda but really i was you know fizzy fizzy water like at all drunk and it's funny because i love being what's actually that's another one of my tricks is that i don't drink a lot and um a lot of people do and that's another thing with especially in comedy where you know my shows will be at nighttime by the time the show's over everybody's drunk and you know if you're sober and everybody's drunk, you can unmask and behave however the frick you want because nobody will notice and nobody will remember. So that's actually one of my health tips is just don't drink and hang around with drunk artists. I I like Like doing that as well. I find it really really pleasant to be around. Like even if I'm not drunk, I find it really nice to be around people like that because it's kind of like you can see because uh, they their expressions are obviously like enhanced and you can see what emotion they're feeling so it's a lot more clear um with with well, their signs and, stuff. The, and also the uh, yeah the the alcohol like the alcohol and, and any kind of drug what it does is it just limits like your you know it allows you to relax and i think most of the time nobody you know that's why you know people drink so many people are alcoholics <laughs> or, or addicts yeah. is because everybody is socially neurotic and it's uncomfortable these social settings are, i think well i know from doing comedy whenever i say who the f- or sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to swear but You're who here allowed. doesn't like small talk the whole <laughs> audience will like erupt and like thank you yeah, for yeah. like nobody actually likes it it's more just it's it's just things that we have to do and um some people are more tolerant than others Mm -hmm. and yeah for us it's our biology that makes us like so intolerant to it but there are a lot of um like commonalities you know between like introverts and autistics so even if your date like my partner actually is is introverted and you know there are a lot of things that she naturally likes to do like i'd actually say that i'm more social Mm -hmm. than she is because because for comedy I need to be like interacting with people and it's almost now like I enjoy going to parties because people know that I'm sort of out there and they do enjoy my approach to life and I am sort of like unmasked that I do enjoy like playing with people I like I need to get material or I do like kind of going and you know Mm -hmm. pushing the envelope or like um you know if we're you know, just doing, yeah, just if we're like having a cocktail or a dinner party, I like to, at a dinner party or something, you know, I like to just be silly or like start drinking it weird or like make a weird comment and see people's reactions. So I would say that I'm actually more social than my partner. It's so really interesting. That helps when you find somebody, yeah. Like with um, your, uh, you know, like you were saying about how you're you used to be extroverted and now you're introverted. To some, to some degree um mm-hmm. whereas like it's it's sort of been like the opposite for me so I've always I, I I crave interaction with people a lot um and it's not 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 even just people that I know very well I very much I, I like going and networking and stuff <laughs> I really enjoy it and um I think when I was younger 
the reason why I was so introverted is because I just, people wouldn't sort of give me the time of day when I was that age, when I was younger. Whereas like now people are a bit more open to what you've got to say and they don't really neglect your differences and just start push you to the side because you're the, the weird kid. Um, but yeah, I used mm-hmm. to be like the, the analyst and now I am, I'm still, I'm sort of, I'm in the middle of ex- extroversion and introversion and I'm just, I like, I like doing that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I think, I think, I think definitely as, as you sort of get older, you, you, you sit into, sit into uh, what you like more. And I think that stage of uh, understanding what you want comes a bit later um, for autistic people because you're always you're always sort of lagging a little bit behind because you just feel like everyone's just not growing up faster, but they're progressing faster socially and you can't keep up. So you're always sort of trailing behind. And then once you get to a certain age and you realize, oh, you know what? I am actually different. And then you start to like understand yourself a bit more but yeah cool um so yeah there is there is uh, some differences in sort of autistic relationships and and uh neurotypical in terms of like the approach to it and also you know there are some benefits of dating someone who has as you said like the same same sort of brain stuff <laughs> and um also some downsides in terms of like the main difficulties autistic people face in relationships do you do you know of like the like the main things that are sort of bog standard for any sort of relationships in terms of what makes them challenging yeah what what are the common common things that you know we we slip up slip up on as 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 uh, autistic people yeah i think um, well, one thing that's really important, we are all individuals, but again, we're just coming back to like our approach, our approach to life. And a lot of that has to do with our like sensory reactions and also the way that we experience time mm-hmm. and uh, how we interpret things is so different for than for neurotypical people. Um, and I think, you know, just one thing that I always struggle with again is like verbal and emotional cues and also again needing the space Mm -hmm. to recharge and I think there's um like as a one thing that's interesting and fun about being queer is that it's the same thing with autistics in terms of like because there isn't really like a standard queer relationships have only been in the mainstream for the last really I'd say like 20 years um, and and there's only a few TV shows like for lesbians, there really is only like the L word that like actually shows lesbian women having relationships and, and dating. And and still that's very like stylized because they're all rich and live in Hollywood. So um, there's this great book that I have called Sex from Scratch, Creating Your Own Relationship Rules. And I think that's really important for all relationships to like start off like that you come into it knowing that like I'm an individual, you're an individual, what do you you need and how can (laughs) I, what do you want? And then going, going from there, because I think one thing that's really customary with autistics is that we do need that like time and space to recharge, to hyper-focus, to sort of just like, I'm doing this and I don't know when I'm going to, yes, I don't know when I'm going to resurface. You do you. (laughs) We need it. We need it. And I think that's hard for neurotypicals to sort of comprehend because they might say like, well, when are you going to come out or when when is this? And you have to be like, yeah. (laughs) Or or that like quality time has to be like cuddling on the couch, doing this and that. Whereas That's usually like their downtime, isn't it? It's just. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, well, we're not really doing anything. We're just like, like stewing in our energy juices. And I'm hot and uh, like, I don't, I don't want you to touch me right yeah. now. And I've, my mind's I going a million miles a minute. I need to go. Yeah. I need to go right. Or I need to go outside and uh, mm. I don't need you to be around me. Um, 
and that's like and that's so funny because I think especially in heteronormative relationships there's that need to like do stuff together all the time and if you're not or you know I'll actually because me and my partner are both so independent we're also like I wouldn't say we're open but we're definitely like you know monogamish and I do travel a lot and stuff so we and she knows like when I'm traveling and I'm doing comedy if she's gonna if she sends me a million messages like how are you what's going on blah 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 like that will stress me out because I'm usually really focused on comedy and getting my bearings Mm -hmm. that having the pull to like think about home when I'm trying to do my job is 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 too much I can't handle it does like sort of Um, like pull you out pull you out of your own little headspace and it takes a while to sort of get back into it even even just like yeah I think that's like an autistic thing where yeah I think that's an autistic thing where we're like very I used to live with a Buddhist monk uh, when I lived in Ghana and I spent a lot of time in silence and and I've done like some pretty hardcore retreats and and one thing that I've never struggled with as an autistic person is like being present when I'm like when I'm have a task or when whatever I'm always really present it's you know obviously the my anxiety and my um hyper awareness of you know about neurotypical things can really shut me down or or distract me from what I'm presently doing but when I'm happy and when things are going well in my life the ability to be sort of present and hyper engaged is is something that comes very naturally yeah. to autistics and like neurotypical people like strive it's called flow or i guess yeah, in flow the state community. flow state autistics we can get to that flow state and some people will I, I kid you not like they you know will pay people thousands of dollars to try and get them into this flow state yeah, there's, so there's it's loads good, of like, like our, again our self-help stuff and and things about like flow states and how to get into it and how to stay concentrated and I think like <laughs> I, I I definitely can get into those like little flow states where I, I really enjoy stuff and I, I don't want to get out of them like I think there was one mm-hmm. time where I was writing a dissertation and it was the one about like autism and mental health and um uh, I, I you know I could go for like days like I, I think I went for like two days once where I I didn't eat and I I even like would you know probably like go to the bathroom like once a day and just because I was so engaged in what I was doing and I didn't want to pull myself away from it and <laughs> it is really bad like <laughs> you know that that's mm-hmm. when having I, a, I think actually that's when having like a yeah, neurotypical partner can but, help <laughs> well big time so I was gonna say like transitioning is really really hard for autistics so we get like stuck into something and hyper flowing like even the, just going from like the bathroom to brush our teeth back to getting ready to like those yeah, you know little transition unquote, executive times. functioning skills are are really hard and and um and they can be quite jarring like I have to set a timer in the morning when I'm getting ready to go to work or if I have a deadline because I it could take like I could like be brushing my teeth and think like it's been 30 seconds and then you know my partner is like it's gotta go in now. the bathroom for like 17 <laughs> minutes like what are you doing and I'm like oh my god now I'm like looking at this material that's on you know my towel and wondering what kind of material that is and now like oh wait there's like something that i've missed got a ding in the on my bathtub phone. like what's this like, new article on yeah oh yeah Reddit. i should post about this <laughs> on instagram so yeah like that um it's yeah it's and it's something that drives us crazy because we want to just be able to be in one state for a day and then and sleep seamlessly and then be in another state when we wake up yeah and, yeah I, I do think like transitioning between places is really difficult because it's like my my partner will just, you know, she'll get out get out from the living room. She'll go up and do stuff, and then she'll come back, and then she'll be like, "Oh, I've got to do that," and she'll get up and she'll come back, and she'll be she'll seemingly be in the same state. I mean, she'll just switch into this relaxation state. Whereas it takes me like ten, fifteen, twenty minutes, even like half an hour sometimes, just to get back into relax relaxing, <laughs> and it's really hard, like. I, I I really struggle with um brushing my teeth for that reason. Like I sometimes 
quite embarrassingly, I sometimes take like a glass with me to bed and my toothbrush because I know that it's going to be a task to try and get my butt out of bed Mm -hmm. and down and do hygienic adulting things and uh, don't like it. Don't like it. It's not great. Yeah, (laughs) big big time. Yeah, I think like that's one thing that's really important in or like a a good thing to be aware of within relationships is that how can you um, help each other um, achieve like your tasks and stuff. And that even with like ND, ND, like two autistics in a relationship, um, yeah, not everybody, autistics are all different. So we all struggle Mm -hmm. with similar things, but our our reactions are different as well. So I've definitely been um, in relationships with autistics where, or an autistic where, um, yeah, like I am almost like better. I've become the person who's like, better at the transitions or I'm mm-hmm. the one and that it's almost like being around somebody who um I struggles with like the same thing but more um intensely all of a sudden I can understand like how to do it because I'm noticing yeah. I'm like and there's you, you sort of have to seeing it outside you? of myself someone someone has to do it and yeah I can obviously I like I've never been in a relationship with an autistic person um but I you know, if if the the environment around you does start to get a bit cluttered and stuff, it, I can imagine that some one of you will have to do it, <laughs> and um, yeah, one of mm. you does, and then it can usually be like a, the same thing. It's like a battle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can see that. But like, what qualities of autistic individuals do you think make them good partners? Because you know, we talk a lot about the difficulties and the, the struggles of it, but there are a lot of positives to it. And what what kind of positives do you yeah, think, I think like autistic people bring? Well, I mean, who who wouldn't want to date me, right? I'm amazing. <laughs> so no uh, You're a shining star. Um, no, I sky. think <laughs> ready for right. someone I'm, to catch. I'm perfect. We're perfect. We're just we're just misunderstood. <laughs> we're we're totally perfect. Mm-hmm. You just need to like take a closer look and your problems will be solved with autistics. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think there's uh, many qualities that we've kind of al- already kind of touched on, but just one thing, uh, we're very loyal. And uh, I think we, we that empathy and our, our uh, ability to feel really under the surface and that autistic intuition and instincts that we have when we trust them uh we're like you know natural i feel like we're almost like the quality of all of the like harry potter houses you know we have that like hufflepuff like loyalty um we when we are in a situation where we're supported and able to give it our all and research we are extremely fierce and we'll stand up against mm-hmm. you Go know the gryffindor, the powers that gryffindor be, like, courage we got that Gryffindor, like Greta Thunberg, like, you know. Bit of, bit of Ravenclaw in intelligence mixed in there. Oh, and of course, I think I don't know one autistic person who, you know, isn't highly, highly intelligent, which again is why I think often we don't get diagnosed right away is that we think that autistics are only highly intelligent in math but i mean I'm again, terrible I, at I cannot do math to save Hooray! my life yeah shattering um, stereotypes but i was right i i was writing essays it's so annoying like i was writing essays when i was in grade two on like Whoa. you know to basically argue out of getting out of homework <laughs> and stuff. i wrote this essay so i don't believe i need to do homework and then i was still like you know oh she's just average yeah. you know or like we're not really sure she's just class clown we're not sure what, what what's Me, up there yeah Class clown. Um, so yeah, we're extremely, <laughs> extremely intelligent. We're funny. I think the one of the qualities I think is the best, and, and again, like I'm in a more like non traditional sort of like open structure, and the quality. And I and a lot of my friends are. This is like the big thing in the gay community is the whole like polyamory, non monogamy. I don't even know. Although again, more labels. Um, but I think one thing that's really 
amazing about us is that because we feel so many different things and we have different emotions, our reactions are not like they're more in depth. And someone almost had to like teach me like what jealousy means. Uh, I think like um, once we kind of we're, we're, we're good learners, but in general, I think like we're more accepting and we're Mm -hmm. when allowed to sort of think freely and naturally. And we need Um, need a lot of like explanation, a lot of like dissection. Yeah, we need an explanation to like, yeah, but I think like it's almost like sometimes these concepts are almost like too simple. And when someone, I remember when someone explained like jealousy to me and I was just like, well, that's dumb. You know, like people actually like, obviously experience jealousy but it's it's much deeper and it's different and I think like it's important and one thing that we can really learn from autistics is that like our emotions are so complex like it's not just like oh you know this person's better at something than me I feel bad like we just don't have these such like Mm-hmm. emotions and feelings that can be categorized in these little to write an essay. they're really always we really need to write an essay, but I think sometimes we like learn those quick reactions. Like I learned, like if somebody takes something from you, you make an angry face and act angry. So I think a lot of the time I was like <laughs> becoming neuro, you know what I yeah, mean? Like I a lot of the time I didn't actually want to react the way I was quote unquote supposed you felt to. Like you had to. So But I felt like I had to, like, same with, like, crying or, like, you know, my uncle passed away a few months ago and I lost a friend recently. And, you know, it's not just you look bad or you look crazy if you're not reacting. And actually, my my family is, I'm sure, all on the spectrum. We're all weirdos. My mom was a clown. It's genetic to a large degree. um, Definitely. I 100%. In my family, but I think both of my parents are on the spectrum. Hey. I hope they don't listen to this. Actually, I hope Hello. they do. You're on the spectrum, Hi. parents. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> also, if my dad's um, listening to this, yeah, you definitely so it, are as well. Just say. <laughs> there we go. And my dad stems like nonstop, and I'm always like, "Dad, like, what are you doing with your arms? Like, I'm not doing anything with my arms. They're just arming." Mm. So um, I'm like, "No, that's not what arms do." But anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think like when we listen to autistics in terms of the how there can be many different reactions and responses to different situations, that every situation is unlike any other situation yeah. and must be treated as yeah. something new. Not not something that you That's can like. That's our biggest gift. Not something that you can like cross over into. It has to have its own definition. It has to have its own things linking to other mm-hmm. things that it's you not know like you can say if this yeah i think neurotypical society operates on this thing of if 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 a then b if c then yeah. d if d then x go back to a and like that's not life isn't like that and we're i think i understand why society is organized like that because you know there's a lot of freaking people in this world we have to, we do have to have some rules it's the understanding though that um yes situations look like other situations but to autistics they do not feel like the same no. situations yeah. i can be like especially like <sighs> i've had sexual relationships that are like super intense and super sexual and super intimate and touching and all that because that boundary with that person allowed me to go really deep. And I've had other relationships where if someone tried to like, you know, if I brush against somebody who has weird energy, I'm like, ah, don't like get away. You know, I but think you like we're soul. very, yeah, but I'm like, I like them as a person, um, you know, and I think too, that's one thing I do really like about again in queer relationships that there's a lot more emphasis on different intimacy. Like again, asexual is a thing. It doesn't mean that they don't want intimacy it's just different and i think that in neurotypical especially heterosexual relationships um you have to be so much more secretive about like your kinks or about what make you don't want to nobody wants to admit that they're different whereas in queer relationships we're all like well we're already different it's like try and find a relationship that is the same 
And that's yeah. really true for autistics. You have to like go into that going like this relationship is about me and you, nobody else. Forget what you've learned. Forget what anybody has told you. It's about me and you. And, and what do we each need? And for me, I need a lot of alone time and I need a lot of space to explore myself and also become grounded again. And uh, yeah, when I travel, I need to be present doing what I'm doing. And I don't like, you know, being reminded of home because we also love our routines and we love that. So I need to be able to get into a new routine yeah. wherever I go. So almost sometimes having my partner with me or having my partner, you know, call me and stuff like that can be like a reminder that I'm not at home in my routine. I'm somewhere new and it's too much for me to handle. Yeah. But I also need to know that if I need to call her and if she needs to call me, like, I'm not going to be like, we don't, it's, we can't talk. remember, we have rules where we don't no call way. each other when we're it away. Violates the it's contract. like, you still need to. <laughs> no way. You signed it. This is I'm going to take you to call. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's tough. And that also, again, with expectations where, you know, neurotypicals, you know, have this whole thing where they're not thinking about us in the same way because they're thinking about themselves and we're so used to thinking about other people that we orient ourselves off what other people are are doing and it's a good reminder to remember that like it's okay to think about ourselves and that expectations are not always you know somebody doesn't know what they want all the time and so neurotypicals and this happened to me recently where you know, somebody just really wanted to just see how, like, really like what was happening. Let's just feel it out. And for me, I just didn't understand what that meant. Mm. And uh, that the anxiety of where is this going or how do you Use feel your emotions about me? to navigate um, the world? <laughs> what? What is this? Yeah. And it was the most intense relationship I'd had. So I was like, how is this, like, just feeling just it out, non relationship? <laughs> it's not chill. Yeah, not chill. Don't like, like it. more in, more intense than <laughs> like a, yeah, a, like monogamous like we're together sort of thing, and that made me yeah, I had too much anxiety. It made me shut down a lot because I just really couldn't process it. Hmm. And uh, yeah, then when we were gonna be friends, same thing. I was like, I don't even know how to go about like being friends because I feel like you're still acting the same yeah. way, like you know, and that yeah it ended up kind of just like falling apart in terms of more just we were approaching things like so different Cross, her, non, her view of just like let's just let's just go with the flow but it was a, her flow was very very intense so although we were extremely like combative compatible yeah, yeah and though we were really compatible and like our energies were really really good it was just like we kept missing each other in terms of like communication yeah and uh yeah, ultimately, it was just too overwhelming hmm. for for me, and then for her, and then. So what? What kind of? Bye, Felicia. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> my my little tardigrad. Have you seen my tardigrad on my YouTube video? Uh, yeah. Have you, Felicia? Um, what do you call them? <laughs> my tardigrad. It's the little microscopic water bear. Felicia. Tardigrad. I, Felicia. I love that you named her that. So we've we've pretty much gone over everything so far, apart from what advice would you give to neurotypicals dating an autistic person for the first time? Like if they have no experience oh. of intimate relationships with autistic people. <laughs> oh dear, I wish I had told this to so many people. Yeah, just but vent it out. Just... Um before. This is like this is triggering for me no I'm kidding um I think one thing that's really important um is that you know your date yeah don't approach them as this person is an autistic just like an autistic person like they're not just their quote-unquote um mind there's so much more to them and that they are human with the same needs as you we all want love we all want respect we all want to achieve our goals if you come at it with that approach it's just how can i support my partner and then in terms of understanding the the fundamentals of um just what it's like to be neurodivergent um 
I was seeing this person who was a psychologist and they did a lot of research. Actually, I didn't even know how much research they did because they didn't tell me they were doing any research. But I was like, how does this person just know how to talk to me and read me and et cetera? And it's because they really had done their homework and I had like gone and asked autistics and gone and Mm -hmm. gone on social media. And I think that's really important to be open. Personal aspect to it as well as like the research Mm -hmm. behind it and that don't expect your partner to just like tell you everything because a lot of the time especially if you live in like a rural place which I do like kind of off the grid where people who have been diagnosed with uh, with autism like they might not be getting any supports maybe all the things that they're learning are from social media too or or um online or in books so you know, learn together, use that as an opportunity to um, bring yourself closer together and like, be like, hey, babe, I read this book. And it said, you know, that hyper focusing uh, was an autistic trait. And yeah, I totally recognize that in you. So now when you go and just read like a book for 17 hours, (laughs) like you're not ignoring me, that's just you, you know, or like, when you're always like one thing I ask my my partner all the time is like are you okay are you okay are you okay and why you know she gets so annoyed like I'm fine yes or stop asking me that but now she knows that it's like when she's laying on the couch just not doing or saying anything like I don't know how she's doing I you, you can't I'm no, read it. And I'm not trying to bother her. I'm literally like, I'm genuinely like, are you okay? Mm-hmm. Like, can you move your limbs? Are you mad? I don't know. You, There's so many things that, that you could be. So it just kind of, yeah, the the awareness of, of the foundations of the autistic mind is, is important. But then also to be able to like, acknowledge your person's individuality as well because I mean sometimes I've had fights with my partner before where she'll just say oh you're acting autistic or you're you're being autistic now as though like I read the book and I'm like huh I could get my way if I have a meltdown I'm like no that's not how it works like and again just because I know how my mind works doesn't mean that and now I'm like, okay, cool. Like I read the rule book and, and the manual can be normal. and I'm good to go forever. <laughs> right. And then I also have to say too, like your, your standard is not the standard. Like, yeah. It's really, that's it's a lot about, as we said, as we said before about um, get, getting an appreciation for just how much we are sort of, so that sounds kind of, kind of bad and a little bit angry, but it's not, it's definitely not meant in this way. But it's it's get, getting appreciation for just how much we change how we communicate and how we accommodate differences in you as well. I think that's that's really important because I think a lot of the time it can sort of feel like, you know, as we said, things come out of nowhere and knowing that we are trying on, you know, like a near constant basis to try and do that kind of thing especially in a, in an initial relationship where neurotypical doesn't have any experience of it we are trying very hard and sometimes it can be quite taxing as well um especially in the early days and stuff but awesome um i think we should probably try and round it up i'm i'm getting very lost in this i'm very hyper focused <laughs> i don't want to stop talking <laughs> me too and i'm definitely not going to edit any of this because i know we we did stray off topic a lot but it's been fun and it's been good um <laughs> super fun but here's here's I like this is here's fun. the hard part um what three main things do you want people to take away from this podcast <laughs> out of everything that we've talked about oh dear <laughs> Wait, um, it's so funny. I'm not joking. Like over the last hour, the weather here has like deteriorated so much. It was like actually a full on like blizzard going on outside my house. And I've just been sitting here in the dark, like watching sort of the storm unfold. So I just turned on my light so I can actually like I had done some like three, three main takeaways to like take mm-hmm. away. One thing, okay, here are my three things. Be open-minded. Relationships are painful enough, but 
pain only heals by sort of moving on with it, being open-minded um, and finding the funny. That's my other thing too. If you are hurt or if there's a misunderstanding, which are extremely, extremely hurtful, please just like la- try and get to a point where you can laugh about it. And that just comes with like mm-hmm. talking like about that. it and just making fun of yourself for sure. Um, and I'm lucky that I have a big stage that I can often talk about <laughs> all of these things with a live audience. And then all of a sudden I realize this is not just an autistic thing. This is a human thing. Yeah. So open your mind. Um, much of what I learned, I've learned in my life is by taking risks. Um, that comes with like actually opening that social media Asper Girl account was one of the biggest risks I've ever taken. Um, I've lived in a lot of countries and I've put myself in places that I think most autistics would describe. I think a lot of people would doubt that I'm autistic because of the things mm-hmm. that I do and have done um, and my background. So I always tell people, if I can do it, you can do it. Or as my uh, West African Guinean uh, dance teacher said, if somebody else can do it, you can also do it. Why? Because you are somebody. So let's try and remember I like that. that. If I see somebody else doing something, I can do it too because I'm just somebody. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing to remember in your relationships, that there's there really isn't on both sides any excuses to not do something or not try. And if you're in that mindset, if you're too negative and you really feel like, there's nothing for you there, then then leave the relationship. Don't try any further. You need to work on yourself. So that's my finding the funny in that moment. Okay, and then the last one is challenges aren't just because you're autistic. Find your strengths and trust them, and then you'll start attracting good people. And that, uh, again, has been my number one lesson is that there are so many things that you can do because you're autistic so if you keep focusing on the things that you'll never be able to do or that you're just not good at like if I really wanted to you know become a mathematician and a math professor or you know programmer it's just gonna make my life challenging so instead I'm gonna focus on the things that I'm amazing at which is writing and connecting and podcasting with people and finding the details and I guess podcast. <laughs> you can add that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah. So just do that. And then the good people who are right for you will come rather than constantly beating yourself up or conforming to a standard or a person that is just not good for you. That is a brilliant. I'm, I'm really glad that you did sort of make a list because it's always been a difficult part of the podcast because. I can't remember what we talked about. So yeah, that's good. I might ask <laughs> people in the either. future to make <laughs> those little lists of people hands just for a little bit of a, you know, get, getting out what you want to say. That's the main thing. Yeah, I think uh, that's something I didn't say in my thing was like, yeah, it is really important if you are, and as a comedian too, if you have a thought in your mind that you cannot articulate or that might come off as mean or whatever, just write it down and come back to it later. Because A, you will forget if it's a good thought and B, you can always rearrange your thoughts and make them better. Um, your uh, for comedy, your joke is never good the first time. It takes like thirty thousand times of telling it. Yeah, cool. Um, should we should we should we have a crack at the last question? I don't. Yeah, yes. let's give it a go. <laughs> um, what does autism mean to you? Uh, I think. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, it means everything and nothing. No. Um, it's Deep. definitely a spectrum. For sure. Uh, I think I've touched on that before where, yes, it is obviously like our, our, there's a genetic component and is our brain structure and how our brain and our senses um, are wired and how we are born. But it's also largely how we choose to label ourselves and and where, and it's reflective of like the culture that we live in and who we're interacting with. So it's really important to like continue to put yourself out there and explore new ways of thinking so to me I guess autism means freedom to see and feel differently 
and it's a powerful gift. I wrote that down. <laughs> difference, difference, definitely is a powerful gift, and I think we need more of that in the world. More people here are willing to express what they feel and what they think and the ways that they view the world. I think it's a really great and amazing thing, and that's probably. I mean, I I can take a a guess that that's probably one of the reasons why you you know you're so successful in the com- world of comedy. It's because you know you'll pick up on things and patterns and behavior that other people won't take a second look at, and I think that's an amazing skill. Brilliant! Like we've talked about a lot today, and I am very happy with the the stuff that we've uh, we've got so far. Um, we've had a lot of difficulties, haven't we? with this podcast (laughs) it's it's definitely been a journey and a testament to autistic perseverance we could have quit but we did not no we've had to redo like a half an hour's get rid of a half an hour's we've had to trail across the internet and try and find ways to recover files all of that good stuff and that's um that's okay. I've just been making memes for the last okay, few minutes. That's, that's so good. I'm good. <laughs> Entertaining yourself <laughs> while I while I struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. So it's um it's been really great to talk to you, and I'm sure everyone that's listening will want to know where they can find you. So do you want to give us a, li- a few little social media links, a few little uh, links that you can give people so they can check out your work? stuff you do sure well if you're not already following me and no pressure um i you can find aspergirl at aspergirl a-s-p-e-r-g-i-r-l i I think Mm -hmm. (laughs) on instagram um and my real name is bb bilodeau uh b i B I L O D E A U is my last name. So B I B I B I L O D E A U. I'm Sounds really like a bad at spelling things out chill. loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's my, so you can find me at bbbilido.com. That's uh, for my personal website with some of my work and comedy stuff. I'm taking a break from my regular social media duties um, at this time. I have a few shows coming up. I will be traveling um, in Canada, in Saskatchewan, and Ontario, and Quebec, I think. So I have to figure out when those dates are. But uh, yeah, I'm still taking a little bit of break from my personal social media um, at this time. I wanted to take December and January off completely from being on the radar and just catching up on some writing and preparing myself, which is always good to do. So if you want to get in touch, the best way is through Asper Girl, and then I can sort of direct you on to other things that might interest you. Cool. And um, so, yeah. And if you're around <laughs> and if you're in town or in country, uh, go check out her comedy and, and tell me how it is. Give me an email. Because um, I would love to yes, go see Yes, and I will one. be posting up my... <laughs> well, I'll be posting my show dates on my website soon. And uh, yeah, I have some videos and stuff like on my website, but I need to add some more and I'm going to be filming some stuff coming up in the next few months as well. So I'll have more things to post and just we'll see what happens. I'm always that's one of my things that I'm getting over is I hate watching myself on camera or knowing that I'm being filmed because as I was telling Thomas earlier my persona on screen is like this really awkward British person so (laughs) yeah I have to (laughs) try and get over this like if I know there's like a film crew around stop being this mechanical like ultra masking British lady (laughs) that seems to come up but people seem to really think she's funny so maybe I can explore that more (laughs) We'll see. To be continued. Awesome. Well, BB, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast and dealing with all of this technical nonsense. It's it is much appreciated. And it's been really great to talk to you. It's been very insightful and I I love these little intellectual conversations about life and emotions and people. It's been really great. Have you enjoyed it? 
I have a lot. This is my first time actually doing a podcast. I've always wanted to, so I can cross it off my bucket list. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to help out and love your work. And hopefully we can inspire some folks to get out there and do their autistic thing. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So if you want to check out any of my other stuff, any of my videos, you can always find that on the YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth. And if you want to check out the podcast on different mediums, I have it on YouTube and Spotify and a few other places. If you're in doubt, go on to Anchor, type in 40 OT Podcast, and it will come up with a lot of different links to different places that you can listen to me and my guests. Uh, But apart from that, if you want to get in contact, if you want to be on the show, maybe you have some ideas of what you want to talk about and you've got some insight and some cool things that we can uh, explore, please let me know at aspergersgrowth at gmail.com and I will get back to you pronto. All said and done, thank you everybody for watching, watching, listening. Thank you everybody for listening and I hope you're having a great day. Stay fresh, stay cool, stay autistic. See you later. Bye. Bye. (laughs) My God, I think that might be an outro. Oh no, I've already ruined it. (laughs) Oh, no, it's perfect. You did well. Thank you.